Kickstarter did a lot for indie horror games, helping to repopularize the genre and launching the careers of several developers and franchises. It also gave us a lot of, well, not so great games, and there are plenty of questionable campaigns in there as well. Let's take a look at some of those today, shall we? The first Kickstarter horror game was, well, I guess that depends on how you define horror, and game, for that matter. You could say it was Zombies Run, whose campaign launched in September 2011. This is a semi-interactive fitness runner. Its story is mostly delivered through audio. You are runner number five, working in a post-apocalyptic society, trying to rebuild, gathering materials for your settlement, and running away from zombies. It's actually a neat idea, and it's still around today. And they've recently added microtransactions, the scariest thing of all. If you don't consider that a game, then the next candidate is Blindside. Its campaign began in October 2011 and successfully raised about $14,000. That's 17 meters, I believe. This is another experimental game, this one relying entirely on audio. The developers were inspired by a chemistry accident one of them had in high school that left them temporarily blind. According to the Kickstarter page, the game is about a young couple, Case and Don, who wake up blind and find that there are monsters outside in the darkness eating people. You control Case as he and Don try to escape and uncover why they can no longer see, what's outside eating people, and what they are going to do about it. You can tell this is an early era Kickstarter because the campaign page is as barren visually as the game itself. There are no images, no screenshots of the game, not that there would be, I guess. Okay, okay, if you don't want to count either of those, then the first real red-blooded American horror video game on Kickstarter is Nevermind, whose Indiegogo campaign ra wait, come on, this is a Kickstarter video. Oh, whatever. Its Indiegogo campaign launched in March 2012 and raised $1,324 out of its $2,000 goal. This was back when Indiegogo allowed campaigns to collect all the money pledged to it, regardless if it reached its goal. Props to developer Aaron Reynolds, they did not give up on this game. They launched a Kickstarter in 2014, which failed, and came back in October 2014, finally raising $76,000. Pitching itself as a biofeed horror, this was not a Ken Levine simulator, but rather a unique technology where the game responds to your emotional state through both a webcam and heart rate monitor. If you let your fears get the best of you, the Kickstarter page reads, the game becomes harder. If you're able to calm yourself in the face of terror, the game will be more forgiving. You play as a neuroprober, basically a therapist that goes into people's minds to remove the things that they're scared of, or at least help them better cope with it. So by showing that you're not scared of them, they don't see you as a target, but if you do allow yourself to be afraid, they pretty much swarm you. It's a clever idea, and these three games really show the potential for Kickstarter not only for horror games, but gaming in general. Unique ideas that would never get funded elsewhere that have an admittedly small but loyal potential audience, and developers with proven track records that all deliver their games on budget and on time. What's that? <laughs> oh, you. <laughs> what a card. Around the same time as Nevermind's initial Indiegogo campaign, Double Fine launched a Kickstarter in February 2012 for what would eventually become Broken Age. And just like that, Kickstarter became more popular than Gautier and Carly Rae Jespin. Jepsen? Je they were both big in 2012, okay? And the increase in popularity inevitably came the decrease in quality. Such was the case with The Dead Linger, the first horror game on Kickstarter after Double Fine's campaign. This infamous campaign raised over $154,000 in April 2012, promising an epic open-world zombie survival thriller and delivering none of it. After years of development and engine changes, backers were finally sent an early alpha version of the game that was borderline unplayable thanks to rampant bugs, missing features, and a lack of content. Development ceased in 2015, though the developers did go on to create Unfortunate Spacemen in 2020, which is, well, the original Among Us. Seriously, check it out. This whole saga with these developers deserves a video of its own someday. Shortly after the Deadlinger's success came Haunt's Immense Macabre, a less well-known debacle, but a debacle nonetheless. Launching in May 2012, the campaign raised just under $29,000. Haunts was a unique turn-based horror game with a hand-drawn art style that allows players to take control of either the haunting denizens that have earned this infamous home its dire reputation, or as the intrepid intruders determined to pry loose the Tyree Manse's dread secrets. 
It was pitched as a co-op game against another person or against AI, and there would have been a single player story campaign too. I say would have been because this game was never finished. Almost straight away, developer Rick Dakin and his team ran into major hurdles mostly on the coding side. They had chosen to code the game in Go, what was then in 2012, a brand new programming language designed by Google. It turns out, despite what Google said at the time, Go is not very good for game development, and Dokken, his team, and Kickstarter backers all learned this the hard way. I say backers because not only was Dokken extremely open about the troubles he and his team were having, detailing all of their issues and public Kickstarter updates in a rather nihilistic tone, they were struggling so much that they released the game's source code publicly and asked backers and even non-backers to help finish. Eventually, Dokken walked away, taking a job at Blue Mammoth Games, where he worked on Brawlhalla. Backers and fans continued working on Haunts, but as far as I can tell, no real progress has been made on it in years. Again, this is a super interesting topic that deserves its own video. I don't, I don't think that's a good idea. I really... I really don't. Um, with these campaigns, I think we've seen the best and worst of Kickstarter. There have been truly incredible and unique ideas by great game developers, yet some of these ideas were a little too incredible to pull off. I think with the case of the Deadlinger, they just weren't able to pull off such a big idea, especially with all that money and attention raising expectations and feature scope and all that. With Haunts, I think it's as simple as picking the wrong platform to build on, so to speak. Now I could go through all of the horror games on Kickstarter in chronological order, but that would take all day. Instead, I just want to share some of the highlights, both good and bad, going forward. Perhaps the most well-known and most beloved horror game from Kickstarter could be Omori, the Undertale RPG with a macabre horror twist. You must travel between two worlds, both welcoming, both concealing the same secrets, the description reads. Meet new, old people, fighting new, old enemies. Explore your own memories, and uncover some hidden truths along the way, although you wish you hadn't. When the time comes, you can only choose one. The campaign was popular for its gorgeous yet surreal art and striking resemblance to Earthbound and Mother. Sure, everyone and their dog is making an Earthbound RPG these days, but when the Kickstarter launched in 2014, it was fairly unique. I compared it to Undertale, but this was actually a year before Toby Fox's masterpiece came out. The game is also based on the creator's already popular webcomic of the same name. It took a hot minute that being six years, but the game finally released in 2020, nice timing, to rave reviews. Nightcry debuted to no less fanfare, but its ultimate reception was much more… mixed. From Japanese developer Hifumu Kono, creator of Clock Tower, Nightcry was pitched as the spiritual successor to the classic yet forgotten series. They even got Japanese director Takashi Shimuzu, who directed The Grudge and Juan, to make a live-action trailer for the game. Originally dubbed Project Scissors, the campaign raised over $314,000, and the final game released only a year later. And it probably could have used more time in the oven, as the game was savaged by critics and fans alike. It was buggy, ugly, featured outdated gameplay, no voice acting, and a terrible story. A game that was better received was, and you might want to brace yourselves for this, Baldi's Basics and Education and Learning. Yes, the infamous meme game that at one point rivaled Five Nights at Freddy in the Internet Cultural Olympics was on Kickstarter. In 2021, to be specific, Mika McGonagall created the game for Itch.io's inaugural Meta Game Jam in 2018, where it won second place. First place went to Farfall OS, if you're curious. Baldi's Basics is an absurdist meta humor game inspired by Sonic Schoolhouse, of all things, that technically makes this the the best 3D Sonic game, don't at me. Because of its weirdness and jump scares, it quickly became every YouTuber's favorite game. Later that same year, McGonagall took to Kickstarter for an enhanced version of the game called Baldi's Basics Plus, earning about $61,000. This enhanced version launched in 2020 into early access, but the final release is still a ways off yet. Speaking of early access, Albino Lullaby might be my most disappointing Kickstarter campaign ever. Albino Lullaby's crowdfunder launched in August 2014 by newbie developer Ape Law. It's kind of a combination of Omori and Baldi's Basics in that it's a surrealist and absurd first-person horror game. The game would have been episodic, and while the first episode released in 2015 to positive reviews, no further episodes were ever released, and the developer disappeared not long after. For a more recent game, 
My Work Is Not Yet Done was funded to the tune of $12,000 in 2019. This is an investigative, narrative-driven adventure where your choices impact the course of the story. The game is set in an expansive, open-world environment that eschews the genre tropes of cold-weather survival for a dense, oppressively rainy and humid forest, seamlessly blending procedural generation with a variety of handcrafted locations to ensure a sense of constant disorientation even across repeat playthroughs. That sounds pretty darn good to me, and with its striking minimalist black and white pixel art, I can see how this got funded, though with an initial release date of 2020, it's safe to say work is not yet done on it. Ho oh. ho. The weirdest story for a horror game on Kickstarter might go to Ghost Theory. I already did a whole video on this campaign if you want the full story, but the short version is that after two campaigns, the game was unofficially cancelled after Crytek offered the team a whole bunch of money if they switched to the CryEngine. Not long after that, Crytek nearly went under and Dreadlocks never got paid. This put the team massively behind schedule and caused them to go over budget. Dreadlocks were not shy about posting apocalyptic updates with titles like Hope Dies Last and Final Breakpoint Is Here, before the updates stopped coming altogether and they eventually closed down. Now this wouldn't be a stun locked video if I didn't talk about a 3D platformer and believe it or not, there was indeed a horror 3D platformer on Kickstarter. Weirdly specific, but I'll take it. Toby's Topsy Tale stars a gingerbread man named Toby, exploring a home in the 1970s. As the game progresses, the player will begin to become cognizant of dissonance both in the gameplay and the overall tone. The world grows metamorphically darker, the enemies become harder, the combat and mechanics become more grounded, and the horror starts to show through. It becomes increasingly apparent that things are not as whimsical as the player once thought. I have no idea what any of that means because the Kickstarter doesn't really show any of that. The game seems to be super early in development at the time of the campaign. It was a modest one too, raising only about $2,000 from 50 backers in May 2013. I have no idea what this game is or if it'll even ever come out, but it is one I will watch with great interest. One final game today, that is Sauna 2000. I covered this game way back in 2020 as part of the PlayStation Horror demo disc. It was a promising demo about a man trying to get a sauna going in the Finnish countryside with a huge horror spin. It took it to Kickstarter later that year, raising 2.1 million yen, or about 14,000 US dollars. I bet you didn't think you need an 80s retro aesthetic horror game about Finland made by a Japanese developer, but now you know. There's something strange going on in the woods, an unsettling feeling of evil and the local people know what's up but they aren't sharing it with you. Will you get your sauna going before you find out the hard way what's going on in the forest? Probably, yeah. Horror games have come a long way since 2012. From an innovative period when Kickstarter and Indiegogo were both first starting to a slightly less innovative time when crowdfunding got popular. There were some great games in there for sure, but also a lot of generic first person jump scare fests that were overfunded and whose developers weren't ready for those bigger budgets. In the last few years, with crowdfunding's popularity waning, it sort of equalized with more and great innovative titles that aren't blowing up out of control. There are a bunch more that I didn't look at today, but overall I feel like horror games on the site do have better overall success rates than other genres. I'm looking forward to Sauna 2000, that game is really promising based on the demo and what I've seen so far, and it kind of shows the direction Kickstarter is going in overall. It's hard to say what the future holds for Kickstarter horror games, but I don't see it changing very much, honestly. Uh, not a very exciting ending, was it?